Factory. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory by Roald Dahl. Part 2. <laughs> Chapter 13. The Big Day Arrives. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, the big day arrives, which was tomorrow, because Charlie found his ticket just the day before, which was to be the 1st of February, and they read the golden ticket. And they wanted all of the stories of all the people that found their tickets, and they got instant celebrity. And so now... Here we are, the next day, the 1st of February. It doesn't exactly say where it is that Wonka's Chocolate Factory is, but uh, poking around on the interwebs, I discovered that it was either London or Munich, which is kind of interesting. Um, it is a large town, and this is one of those things that I enjoy about Rob Dahl's work, is that he, came, he doesn't place them specifically unless it's required, and then, um, but it could be just about anywhere. Chapter 13. The Big Day Arrives. The sun was shining brightly on the morning of the big day, but the ground was still white with snow, and the air was very cold. Outside the gates of Wonka's factory, enormous crowds of people had gathered to watch five lucky ticket holders going in. The excitement was tremendous. It was just before ten o'clock, and the crowds were pushing and shouting, and policemen with arms linked were trying to hold them back from the gates. Right beside the gates, in a small group that was carefully shielded from the crowds by the police, stood the five famous children, together with the grown-ups who had come with them. The tall, bony figure of Grandpa Joe could be seen quietly standing among them, and beside him, holding tightly onto his hand, was little Charlie Bucket himself. All the children, except Charlie, had both their mothers and their fathers with them, and it was a good thing that they had, otherwise the whole party might have gotten out of hand. There were so They were so eager to get going that their parents were having to hold them back by force to prevent them from climbing over the gates. "'Be patient!' cried fathers. Be still, it's not time yet, it's not ten o'clock. Behind him, Charlie Bucket could hear the shouts of the people in the crowd as they pushed and fought to get a glimpse of the famous children. There's Violet Beauregard, said someone. Yeah, it's her, all right. I can remember her face from the newspapers. Oh, and you know what? She's still chewing that dreadful old piece of gum she's had in there for three months. Look at her, Josh, she's still working on it. <laughs> Who's that big fat boy? That's Augustus Gloop. So it is. Enormous, isn't he? Fantastic. Who's the kid with a picture of the Lone Ranger stenciled on his Winchester? Winchester? That's Mike TV. He's the television fiend. <laughs> he must be crazy. Look at all those toy pistols he's got hanging all over him. The one I want to see, to see is Veruca Salt, shouted another from the crowd. She's the girl whose father brought up a half a million chocolate bars and then made the workers in his peanut factory. Unwrap every one of them until they found a golden ticket. He gives her anything she wants. Absolutely anything. She has only to start screaming for it and gets it. Dreadful, isn't it? Shocking, I call it. What do you think he... What, which do you think is her? That one, over there on the left. She's a girl in a silver mink coat. Which one's Charlie Bucket? Charlie Bucket? He must be the skinny little shrimp, standing beside the old fellow who looks just like a skeleton. Very close to us. See? Yes, there he is. Carefully doesn't turn to the side. Why, he is. Hasn't he got a coat on in this cold weather? Don't ask me. Maybe he can't afford to buy one. Goodness me, he must be freezing. Charlie, standing only a few paces away from the speaker, gave Grandpa Joe's hand a squeeze. And the old man looked down at Charlie and smiled. Somewhere in the distance, a church clock began striking. Ten. Very slowly, with a loud creaking of rusty hinges, the great iron gates of the factory began to swing open. The crowd suddenly became silent. The children jumped, stopped jumping about. All eyes were fixed upon the gates. There he is! That's him! And so it was.
Chapter 14 Mr. Willy Wonka Mr. Wonka was standing all alone, just inside the open gates of the factory. And what an extraordinary little man he was! He had a black top hat on his head, and he wore a tail coat made of a beautiful plum-coloured velvet. His trousers were bottle green, and his gloves were pearly grey. And he carried in one hand a fine gold-topped walking cane. Covering his chin there was a small, neat, pointed black beard, a, a goatee. Oh, you mean like this? <laughs> Actually, this is technically a Van Dyke because it has top and bottom. A goatee is just the bottom, just keeping that for note. And his eyes, his eyes were the most marvellously bright. They seemed to be sparkling and twinkling at, all, at you all the time. And the whole face, in fact, was alight with fun and laughter. And oh, how clever he looked, how quick and sharp and full of life. He kept making quick little jerky movements with his head, cocking it this way and that, and talking everything, uh, taking everything in with his bright, twinkling eyes. He was like a squirrel in a quickness of his movements, like a quick, clever old squirrel from the park. Suddenly, he did a funny little skipping dance in the snow, and he spread his arms wide, and he smiled at the five children who were clustered near the gates, and he called out, Welcome, my dear little friends! Welcome to the factory! His voice was high and fluty. Will you come forward at once in a time, please? And bring your parents. Then show me your golden ticket and give me your name. Who's first? The big fat boy stepped up. I'm Augustus Gloop. Augustus! cried Mr. Wonka, seizing his hand and pumping it up and down with terrific force. My dear boy, how too so good to see you, delighted, charmed, overjoyed to have you with us. And these are your parents. How nice. Come in, come in. That's right. Step through the gates. Mr. Wonka was clearly as excited as everybody else. My name, said the next girl, girl is Veruca Salt. My dear Veruca, how do you do? What a pleasure this is. Do you have an interesting name now, don't you? I always thought that a Veruca was a sort of wart that you got on the sole of your foot. <laughs> but I must be wrong, mustn't I? How pretty you look in that lovely mink coat. <laughs> dear me, this is going to be such an exciting day. I do hope you enjoy it. I'm sure you will. I know you will. Your father. How are you, Mr. Salt and Mrs. Salt? Overjoyed to see you. Yes, the ticket is quite in order. Please, please go in. The next two children, Violet Beauregard and Mike TV, came forward to have their tickets examined and then to have their arms practically pumped off of their shoulders by the energetic Mr. Wonka. And last of all, a small, nervous voice whispered, Charlie Bucket. Charlie! Well, well, so there you are. You're the one who found your ticket only yesterday. Aren't you? Yes, yes. I read all about it in this morning's papers. Just in time, my dear boy. I'm so glad. So happy for you. And this, your grandfather? Delighted to meet you, sir. Overjoyed. It's enraptured, enchanted. All right, excellent. Is everybody in now? Five children? Yes, yes, good. Now, will you please follow me? Our tour is about to begin. But do... Keep together. Please don't wander up for yourselves. Uh, I shouldn't like to lose any of you at this stage of the proceedings. Oh, dear me, no. <laughs> Charlie glanced back over his shoulder and saw the great iron gate entrance slowly closing behind him. The crowds on the outside were still pushing and shouting, and Charlie could took a last look at them. Then, as the gates closed with a clang, all sight of the outside world disappeared. Here we are. Through this big red door, please. That's right, it's so nice and warm inside. I have to keep it warm inside the factory because of these workers. My workers are used to extremely hot climate. They can't stand the cold. They'd perish if they went outdoors in this weather. They'd freeze to death. But who are these workers? Where were these workers? asked Augustus Gloop. All in good time, my dear boy. Be patient. You shall see everything as we go along. All of you inside? Good. 
Would you mind closing the door? Thank you. Charlie Bucket found himself standing in a long corridor that stretched away in front of him as far as he could see. The corridor was so wide that a car could easily have driven been driven along it, and the walls were pale pink. The lighting was soft and pleasant. How lovely and warm, whispered Charlie. I know, and that's all great. What's that great marvellous smell, answered Grandpa Joe, taking a long, deep <sighs> sniff. All of the most wonderful smells in the world seem to be mixed up in the air around them. The smell of roasting coffee. Ugh. <laughs> Burnt sugar. <laughs> Melting chocolate. Mint. Violets. Crushed hazelnuts. Apple blossom. Caramel and lemon peel. And far away in the distance, from the heart of the great factory, came a muffled roar of energy as though some monstrous, gigantic machine was spinning its wheels at breakneck speed. Now this, my dear children, said Mr. Wonka, raising his voice above the noise, this is the main corridor. Will you please hang your coats and hats on those pegs over there, and then follow me? That's right, that way. Good, everyone ready? Yes, yes, come on then, here we go. <laughs> he trotted off rapidly down the corridor with the tails of his plum-colored velvet coat flapping behind him, and the visitors all hurried after him. It was quite a large party of people when you came to think of it. There were nine grown-ups and five children, and fourteen in all. So you can imagine that there was a good deal of pushing and shoving as they hustled and bustled down the passage, trying to keep up with the swift little figure in front of them. Come on, come on, we'll get a move on, please. We'll never get round. To, we'll never get round today if you dwaddle like this. So he turned right off the corridor, my off the main corridor, into another slightly narrower passage. Then he turned left. Then left again. Then right. Then left, then right, then right, then left. The place was like a gigantic rabbit warren. Ah, uh, warren, um, uh, gigantic rabbit, rabbit, rabbit hotel, <clears throat> with passages leading this way and that in every direction. Don't you let go of my hand, Charlie, said Grandpa, whispered Jack, Grandpa Joe. Notice how all of these passages are sloping downwards. We are now going underground, and all the most important rooms in my factory are deep down below the surface. Why is that? There wouldn't be nearly enough space for them on top. These rooms we are going to see are enormous. They're larger than football fields. No buildings in the world will be big enough to house them. But down here, beneath the ground, I've done all the space I want. There's no limit, so long as I hollow it out. Mr. Wonka turned right. He turned left. He turned right again. And the passages were sloping steeper and steeper downhill. Is everything going all right? Yes. Okay. Something seems to have reset itself. All right. My page automatically reloaded, and I didn't want to miss any of this fantastic dialogue. The passages were sloping deeper, steeper, and deeper, and deeper downhill. Then suddenly, Mr. Wonka stopped. In front of him, there was a shiny metal door. The party crowded round him, and on the door, in large letters, it said, The Chocolate Room. Chapter 15. The Chocolate Room. An important room, this, cried Mr. Wonka, taking a bunch of keys from his pocket and slipping one into the keyhole of the door. This is the nerve centre of the entire factory. 
and the heart of the whole business, and is so beautiful. I insist upon my rooms being absolutely beautiful, and I cannot abide ugliness in factories. Where in we go then, but do be careful, my children. Don't lose your heads, don't get over excited, and keep very calm. Mr. Wonka opened the door. Five children and nine grown-ups pushed their ways in, and <gasps> oh, what an amazing sight. They were looking down upon a lovely valley. There were green meadows on either side of the valley, and along the bottom of it there flowed a great brown river. What is more is that there was a tremendous waterfall halfway along the river, a steep cliff over which the water curled and rolled in a solid sheet and then went crashing down into a boiling, churning pool of <gasps> whirlpool of froth and spray. Froth and spray, I say. Froth and spray. It was a fray of froth. Chocolatey froth and spray. <laughs> yes, certainly. Below the waterfall, or as... Um, chocolate fall, I guess you would call it, was a whole mass of enormous glass pipes that were dangling down into the river from somewhere up high in the ceiling. They were really enormous, these pipes. And there must have been a dozen of them at least, and they were sucking up the brownish, muddy water from the rivers and carrying it away to goodness knows where. And because they were made of glass, you could see the liquid flowing and bubbling along inside of them, and above the noise of the waterfall, you could hear the never-ending <coughs> of the pipes as they did their work. Graceful trees and bushes were growing along the river bank. Weeping willows and alders and tall clumps of rhododendrons with their pink and red and mauve blossoms. In the meadows there were thousands of buttercups. There! cried Mr. Wonka, dancing up and down and pointing his gold-topped cane at the great brown river. It's all chocolate! Every drop in that river is a hot, melted chocolate of the finest quality. The very finest. There's enough chocolate in there to fill every bathtub in the entire country. <laughs> and all the swimming pools as well. Isn't it terrific? And just look at my pipes. They suck up the chocolate and carry it away to the other rooms in the factory where it is needed. Thousands of gallons an hour, my dear children, thousands upon thousands of gallons. <laughs> the children and their parents were too flabbergasted to speak. They were staggered. They were dumbfounded. They were bewildered and dazzled. They were completely bowled over by the hugeness of the whole thing. They simply stood and stared. The waterfall is the most important. It mixes the chocolate, it churns it up, it pounds it in, it beats it, and it makes it light and frothy. No other factory in the world mixes its chocolate by waterfall. Good evening, Miss Ollendorf. But it is the only way to do it properly. The only way? And do you see my trees? <laughs> and my lovely bushes. Don't you think they look pretty? I told you I hated ugliness. And of course they are all eatable. All made of something different and delicious. And do you like my meadows? Do you like my grass and my buttercups? The grass is that you are standing on, my dear little ones. It's made of a new kind of soft, schmindy sugar that I've just invented. It, I call it swudge. Try a blade. Please do. It's delectable. Automatically, everybody bent down and picked up one blade of grass. Everybody, that is, except Augustus Gloop, who took a large handful and Violet Beauregard, before tasting her blade of grass, took out the piece of world, world record-breaking chewing gum out of her mouth and stuck it carefully behind her ear. Isn't it wonderful? Hasn't it got a wonderful taste, Grandpa? I could eat the whole field. <laughs> I could go round from all fours like a cow and eat every blade of grass in this field. <laughs> Try a buttercup. They're even nicer. Suddenly. The air was filled with screams of excitement. The screams came from Veruca Salt. She was pointing frantically to the other side of the river. Look! Look over there! He's... What is it? He's moving. He's walking. It's a little person. It's a little man down there below the waterfall. Everybody stopped picking buttercups and stared across the river. 
She's right, Grandpa. It's a little man. Can you see him? I see him, Charlie. <laughs> and now everybody started shouting at once. There's two of them. Oh, my gosh, so there is. There's two of them. So there's one, two, three, four. Uh, there's five. <clears throat> what are they doing? Where do they come from? Who are they? Children and parents alike all rushed down to the edge of the river to get a closer look. Aren't they fantastic? No higher than my knee. <laughs> look at their funny long hair. The tiny men were no, long, no larger than medium-sized dolls, had stopped what they were doing, and now they were staring back across the river at the visitors. One of them pointed towards the children and then whispered something to the other four. They all of them burst into peals of laughter. <laughs> But they can't be real people, said Charlie. Of course they're real people. They're Oompa Loompas. Chapter 16. The Oompa Loompas. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Hmm. Oompa Loompas, everyone said at once. Oompa Loompas, imported directly from Loompa Land, said Walter Wonka proudly. Huh. There's no such place, said Mrs. Salt. Excuse me, dear lady, but Mr. Wonka, I'm a teacher of geography. Then you'll know all about it. And oh, what a terrible country it is. Nothing but thick jungles infested by the most dangerous beasts in the world. Hornswogglers and snozwangers and those terrible wicked wangdoos. Uh, a wangdoodle could eat ten oompalumas for breakfast and came galloping back for a second helping. When I went out there, I found the little oompalumas living in tree houses. They had to live in tree houses to escape the wangdoodles and the hornswogglers and the snozwangers. And they were there living on green caterpillars. And the caterpillars tasted revolting. And the Oompa Loompas spent every moment of their days climbing through the treetops, looking for other things to mash up with the caterpillars to make them taste better. Red beetles, and for instance, and eucalyptus leaves, and the bark of the bong bong tree, and all of them beastly, but not so quite so beastly as the caterpillars. Ugh, poor little Oompa Loompas. The one food they longed for more than anything else was the cacao bean. But they couldn't get it, and Oompa Lump was lucky if he found three or four cacao beans in a year. But oh, how they craved them! They used to dream about cacao beans all night long and talk about them all day. You only had to mention the word cacao to an Oompa Lump, and then he would start driddling at the mouth. The cacao bean, which grows in the cacao tree, happens to be the thing from which chocolate is made. You cannot make chocolate without the cacao bean. The cacao bean is chocolate. I myself use billions of cacao beans every week in this factory. And so, my dear children, as soon as I discovered that the Oompa Loompas were crazy about this particular food, I climbed up to their treehouse village and poked my head in through the door of the treehouse belonging to the leader of the tribe. The poor little fellow, looking thin and starved, was sitting trying to eat a bowl full of mashed caterpillars without being sick. Look here, I said. Speaking not in English, of course, but in Oompa Loompa. Look here, if you and all your people will come back to my country and live in my factory, you can have all the cacao beans you want. I've got mountains of them in my storehouses. You can have a cacao beans for every meal. You can gorge yourself silly on them. I'll even pay your wages in cacao beans if you wish. You really mean it, asked the Oompa Loompa leader, leaping up from his chair. Of course I mean it. And you can have chocolate as well. Chocolate tastes even better than cacao, because it's got milk and sugar added. The little man gave a great whoop of joy and threw his bowl of mashed caterpillars right out of the treehouse window. It's a deal! Come on, let's go! So, I shipped them from all over, every man, woman, and child in Oompa Loompa tribe, and it was easy. I smuggled them over in very large packing cases with holes in them, and they all got here safely, of course. 
They are wonderful workers. They all speak English now. They love dancing and music, and they're always making up songs. I expect you will hear a good deal of singing today from time to time. I must warn you, they are rather mischievous. They like little jokes. They still wear the same kind of clothes they wore in the jungle. They insist upon that. The men, as you can see for yourselves across the river, wear only deer skins, and the women wear leaves, and the children wear nothing at all. The women use fresh leaves every day, of course. Daddy! <clears throat> Veruca Salt, of course. Daddy, I want an Oompa Loompa. I want you to get me an Oompa Loompa. I want an Oompa Loompa right away. I want to take it home with me. Go on, Daddy. Get me an Oompa Loompa. Now, now, my pet. Uh, we mustn't mis interrupt Mr. Wonka. But I want an Oompa Loompa. All right, Veruca, all right. But I can't get it for you this second. Please be patient. I'll see you have one before the day is out. Augustus! Augustus, sweetheart, I don't think you'd better do that. Gloop, as you might have guessed, had quietly sneaked down to the edge of the river and was now kneeling on the riverbank, scooping hot, melted chocolate into his mouth as fast as he could. Perhaps, perhaps. Chapter 17. Augustus Gloop goes up the pipe. When Mr. Wonka turned round and saw what Augustus Gloop was doing, he cried, Oh, no, please, Augustus, please. I beg of you not to do that. My chocolate must be untouched by human hands. Oh, Augustus, oh, didn't you hear what the man said? Come away from that river at once. This stuff is fabulous, say said nothing say, taking not the slightest notice note of his notice of his mother or Mr. Wonka. Gosh, I need a bucket to drink it properly properly. Augustus cried Mr. Wonka, hopping up and down. You must come away. You're dirtying my chocolate. Augustus Augustus But Augustus was deaf to everything except the call of his enormous stomach. He was now lying full length on the ground with his head far out over the river, lapping up chocolate from the river like a dog. Augustus, you'll be giving us that nasty cold of yours to about a million people all over the country. Be careful, Augustus, you're leaning too far out. Mr. Gloop was absolutely right. For suddenly there was a shriek and then a splash and into the river went Augustus Gloop, and in one second he had disappeared under the brown surface of the chocolate river. Ah, oh, save him, said Mrs. Gloop, going white in the face. He'll drown, he can't swim a yard. Save him, save him. Good heavens, woman, I'm not driving, diving in there. I've got my best suit on, said Mr. Gloop. Augustus Gloop's face came up again to the surface, painted brown with chocolate. Help, 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 fish me out, fish me out. Don't just stand there, Mrs. Gloop screamed at Mr. Gloop. Do something. I am doing something, Mr. Gloop, who was now taking off his jacket and getting ready to dive into the chocolate. But while he was doing this, the wretched boy was being sucked closer and closer and closer toward the mouth of one of the great pipes. It was dangling down into the river, and then all at once a powerful suction took hold of him completely, and he was pulled under the surface and then into the mouth of the pipe. The crowd on the riverbank waited breathlessly to see where he would come out. There he goes, said someone pointing upwards, and sure enough, because the pipe was made of Glass, of course. Augustus Gloop could be seen clearly, seen shooting up inside of the pipe, head first, like a torpedo, a rather fat torpedo. Help! Murder! Police! Augustus, come back at once. Where are you going? It's a wonder to me how the pipe isn't big enough for him to go through it, said Mr. Gloop. But it isn't big enough, said Charlie. Oh dear, look, he's slowing down. So he is, said Grandpa Cho. Oh, he's, he, he's going to stick. I think he is, said Grandpa Cho. Oh, by golly, he is stuck. 
It's his stomach that's done it, said Gloop. He's blocked the whole pipe. Look at that, <laughs> said Grandpa Joe. Smash the pipe, yelled Mrs. Gloop. Augustus, come out of that at once. The water, watchers below could see the chocolate swishing around and the boy in the pipe, and they could see it building up behind him in a solid mass. Pushing against the blockage, the pressure was terrific. Something had to give. Something did give, and something was Augustus. Whew. Up he shot again like a bullet out of the barrel of a gun. <laughs> He's disappeared. What does the pipe go quick? Call the fire brigade. Keep calm, please. Keep calm, my dear lady. Keep calm. There is no danger. No danger whatsoever. Augustus has gone on a little journey. That is all. His most interesting little journey. But he'll come out of it just fine. You wait and see. Wonka assured Mrs. Gloop. How can he possibly come out just fine? He'll be made into marshmallows in five seconds. Impossible. Unthinkable. Inconceivable. Absurd, really. He could never be made into marshmallows, said Wonka. And why not? Because that pipe doesn't go anywhere near it. That pipe, the one Augustus went up, happens to lead directly to the room where I make the most delicious kind of strawberry-flavored chocolate-coated fudge. <gasps> then he'll be made into strawberry flavored chocolate coated fudge. They'll be selling him by the pound all over the country tomorrow morning. Mm. Quite right, said Mr. Gloop. I know I'm right, said Mrs. Gloop. It's beyond a joke. Mr. Wonka doesn't think you seem to think so. I just look at him, he's laughing his head off. How dare you laugh at him when my boy's just going up the pipe? You monster! You think it's a joke? You think that sucking my boy up in your fudge room is like a, just one great big colossal joke? He'll be perfectly safe. <laughs> He'll be chocolate fudge! Never, cried Wonka. Of course he will! I won't allow it. And why not? Because the taste would be just terrible. Just imagine it. Augustus-flavoured chocolate-coated gloop. No one would buy it. <laughs> they most certainly would, said Mr. Gloop indignantly. <laughs> I don't want to think about it. Nor do I, said Mr. Wonka, and I do promise you, madam, that your darling boy is perfectly safe. If he's perfectly safe, then where is he? Lead me to him this instant. Mr. Wonka turned round and clicked his fingers. <coughs> Immediately, an Oompa Loompa appeared as if from nowhere and stood beside him. The Oompa Loompa bowed and smiled, showing his beautiful white teeth. His skin was a rosy white. His long hair was golden brown. and The top of his head came, and the top of his head came just above the height of Mr. Wonka's knee. He wore the usual deer skin slung over his shoulder. Now... Listen to me, said Mr. Wonka. I want you to take Mr. and Mrs. Gloop up to the fudge room and help them to find their son Augustus. He's just gone up the pipe. The Oompa Loompa, Oompa Loompa took one look at Mrs. Gloop and exploded into <laughs> peers of laughter. <laughs> oh, do be quiet. Control yourself. Pull yourself together, please. Mrs. Gloop doesn't think it's at all funny. You can say that again, said Mrs. Gloop. Go straight to the fudge room, said to the Oompa Loompa. When you get there, take a long stick and start poking around inside the big chocolate mixing barrel. Um, I'm most certain you'll find him in there, but you'd better look sharp. You'll have to hurry. If you leave him in the chocolate mixing barrel too long, he's liable to get poured out into the fudge boiler. And that really would be a disaster, wouldn't it? My fudge would become quite uneatable. Mrs. Gloop let out a shriek of fury. I'm choking. I didn't mean it. Forgive me. I'm so sorry. Goodbye, Mrs. Gloop and Mr. Gloop. Goodbye. I'll see you later. As Mr. and Mrs. Gloop and their tiny escort hurried away, the five Oompa Loompas on the far side of the river 
suddenly began hopping and dancing about and beating wildly upon a number of very small drums. And here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Augustus Group, Augustus Group, Augustus Group, Augustus Group, 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 Group. Grandpa, listen to them. What are they doing? Shh, I think they're starting to sing us a song, said Uncle Joe. Augustus Group, Augustus Group, Augustus Group, the great big greedy nincompoop. How long could we allow this beast to gorge and guzzle, feed and feast on everything he wanted to? Great Scott, it simply wouldn't do. However long this pig might live, we're positive he'd never give even the smallest bit of fun or happiness to anyone. So, what we do in cases such as this, as we use a gentle touch and carefully we take the brat and turn him into something that will we get great, 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 great give pleasure to us all. A doll, for instance, or a ball, or marbles, or a rocking horse. But this revolting boy, of course, was so unutterably vile, so greedy, foul, and Indian vile, infantile. He left a most disgusting taste inside our mouths, and so in haste we choose a thing that, come what won't come what may, would make that nasty taste away. Come on, we cried, the time is right to send him shooting up the pipe. He's got to go, it has to be, and very soon he's going to see. Inside the room to which he's gone, some funny things are going on, but don't, dear children, be alarmed. Augustus Gloop will not be harmed. Although, of course, we must admit he will be altered quite a bit. He'll be quite changed from what he's been, so when he goes through the fudge machine, slowly the wheels go round and round, the cogs begin to grind and pound. A hundred knives go slice, 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 we add some sugar and some spice, we boil him for a minute more, until we're absolutely sure that all the greed and all the gall is boiled away for once and all. Then out he comes, and now by grace a miracle has taken place. This boy who only just before was loaded by men from shore to shore. This greedy brute, this louse's ear is loved by people everywhere. For who could hate? Oh, bear a grudge against a luscious bit of fudge. <laughs> I told you they loved singing. Aren't they delightful? Aren't they just charming? But you mustn't believe a word they've said. It's nonsense, every bit of it. Are the Oompa Loompas really joking, Grandpa? Of course they're joking. They must be joking. At least I hope they're joking, don't you? <laughs> Chapter 18 Down the Chocolate River off we go! Hurry up, everybody! Follow me to the next room, and please don't worry about Augustus Gloop. He's bound to come out in the wash. They always do. We shall have to make the next part of the journey by boat. Here she comes. Look, there she goes. A steamy mist was rising up now from the great warm chocolate river, and out of the mist there appeared suddenly a most fantastic pink boat. It was a large open rowboat with a tall front and a tall back, kind of like a Viking boat of old. And in it was, uh, and it was of such a shining and sparkling, glistening pink color that the whole thing looked as though it were made of bright pink glass. There were many oars on either side of it, and as the boat came closer, the watchers on the river bank, the Chocolate River, that is, could see that the oars were being pulled by masses of Oompa Loompas, at least ten of them to each oar. This, of course, is my private yacht, said Wonka. I made her by hollowing out an enormous boiled sweet. Isn't she beautiful? <laughs> See how she comes cutting through the river? Mm, yes, 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 yes. The gleaming pink boiled sweet boat glided up to the river bank. One hundred Oompa Loompas rested their oars and stared up at the visitors. One hundred Oompa Loompas rested on their oars and stared it up at all the visitors. <laughs> he does that uh, quite often, and it's really quite a little tasty thing to do. 
Then, suddenly, for some reason best known to themselves, they all burst into shrieks of laughter. <laughs> uh, I want to hang out with those Oompa Loompas. I can't imagine what it would be like if you had got them around some uh, Baileys and hot cocoa. I can say that well. Mm -hmm. Yes, loosen things up a bit. What's so funny? Uh, asked Violet Beauregard. Oh, don't worry about them. They're always laughing. They think everything's a colossal joke. Jump into the boat, all of you. Come on, hurry up, hurry up. And as soon as everyone was safely in, the Oompa Loompas pushed back, pushed the boat away from the riverbank, and began to slowly row downriver. Hey there, Mike TV, please do not lick the boat with your tongue. It'll only make it sticky. Stop that said Mr. Wonka. Daddy, said Veruca, I want a boat like this. I want you to buy me a big pink boiled sweet boat exactly like Mr. Wonka's. And I want lots of Oompa Loompas to row me about. And I want a chocolate river. And I want, and I want... <sighs> she wants a good kick in the pants, said whispered Grandpa Cho to Charlie. <laughs> the old man was sitting in the back of the boat and little Charlie Bucket was right beside him. Charlie was holding tightly onto his grandfather's ebony, oh, bony old hand. He was in a world of excitement. Everything that he had seen so far, the great chocolate river, the waterfall, the huge sucking pipes, the minty sugar meadows, the Oompa Loompas, the big, beautiful pink boat, and most of all, Mr. Willy Wonka himself, had been so astonishing that he began to wonder... whether there could possibly be any more astonishments left. <laughs> Apparently, this young gentleman does not know about the wonders inside of Willy Wonka's head. Where were they going now? What were they going to see? And in what in the world was going to happen in the next room? Isn't it marvellous, said Grandpa Joe, grinning at Charlie. Charlie just nodded and smiled up at the old man. And suddenly, Mr. Wonka, who was sitting on Charlie's other side, reached down into the bottom of the boat, picked up a large mug, dipped it into the river, filled it with chocolate, and handed it to Charlie. Drink this. It'll do you good. You look starved to death. Then Mr. Wonka filled a second mug and gave it to Grandpa Joe. You too. You look like a skeleton. What's the matter? Hasn't there been anything to eat in your house lately? Mm, not much, said Grandpa Joe. Charlie put the mug to his lips, and as the rich, warm, creamy chocolate round down his throat into his empty tummy, his whole body, from head to toe, began to tingle with pleasure, and a feeling of intense happiness spread all throughout him. You like it? Oh, it's wonderful. The creamiest, loveliest chocolate I've ever tasted, said Grandpa Joe. Mm. That's because it's been mixed by waterfall. Good evening, Mr. Hetrick. Oh, and Danita, you're in with us as well. Fantastic. The boat got faster and faster as it sped down the river. The river was getting narrower, and there was some kind of dark tunnel ahead. A great round tunnel that looked like an enormous pipe and the river was running right into the tunnel. Ah, so was the boat. Row on, shouted Mr. Wonka. Full speed ahead! And with that, the Oompa Loompas rowing faster and faster than ever, and the boat shot into the pitch-dark tunnel, and all the passengers screamed with excitement. Woohoo! <clears throat> How can they see where they're going? shrieked Violet Beauregard in the darkness. There's no knowing where they're going! <laughs> <laughs> said Mr. Wonka. <clears throat> there is no way of knowing which direction they are going. There's no knowing where they're rowing or which way the river's flowing. Not a speck of light is showing, so the danger must be growing, for the rowers keep on rowing, and they're certainly not showing any signs of slowing. He's gone off his rocker, said one of the fathers, and the other parents joined in the chorus. 
saying, he's crazy, he's balmy, nutty, screwy, batty, he's Debbie, he's dotty, daffy, goofy, beanie, buggy, wacky, loony, loony, loony. No, he's not, said Grandpa Joe. Switch on the lights, shouted Mr. Wonka, and suddenly on came the lights, and the whole tunnel brilliantly lit up, and Charlie could see that they were indeed inside of a gigantic pipe. And the great upward curving walls of the pipe were pure white and spotlessly clean. The river of chocolate was flowing very fast inside of the pipe. And the Oompa Loompas were all rowing like mad. And the boat was rocketing along at a furious pace. And Mr. Wonka was jumping up and down in the back of the boat, calling to the rowers to row faster and faster still. And he seemed to love the sensation of whizzing through the white tunnel in a pink boat on a chocolate river as he clapped his hands and laughed and kept glancing at his passengers to see if they too were enjoying this spectacle as much as he. <laughs> look, Grandpa, look! There's a door in the wall, and it was a green door, and it was set into the wall of the tunnel just as above the level of the river. And as they flashed past it, there was just enough time to read the writing on the door. It said, Storeroom Number 54. It said, All the creams, dairy cream, whipped cream, violet cream, coffee cream, pineapple cream, vanilla cream, and hair cream. Hair cream, said TV. You, 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 don't, you don't use hair cream. Row on, Mr. Wonka, said Mr. Wonka. There's no time to answer silly questions. They streaked past another black door. Storeroom number 71, it said. Whips, all shapes and sizes. Whips, cried Mr. What do you use whips for? <laughs> for whipping cream, of course. How can you whip cream without whips? Whipped cream isn't whipped in loud unless it's whipped with whips. It's just a poached egg, isn't it? Poached unless it's been stolen from the woods in the dead of right. Night. Row on, please, row on. Then they passed a yellow door on which it said, Storeroom number 77. All the beans. Cacao beans, coffee beans, jelly beans, and has beans. Has beans, said Violet Beauregard. <laughs> You're one yourself, said Mr. Wonka. There's no time for arguing. Press on, press on. But five seconds later, a bright red door came into sight ahead, and he suddenly waved his gold, topped cane in the air, and said, Stop the boat! Chapter 19 The Inventing Room Everlasting Gobstoppers and Hair Toffee. When Mr. Wonka shouted, Stop the boat! and the Oompa Loompas jammed their oars into the river and backward, backed water furiously, the boat stopped. The Oompa Loompas guided the boat alongside the red door. On the door it said, Inventing room, private, keep out. Mr. Wonka took a key from his pocket leaned over the side of the boat and put the key into the keyhole. This is the most important room in the entire factory. All my most secret and new inventions are cooking and simmering in here. Old Fickle Goober would give his front teeth to be down loud inside for just three minutes. So would Prodnose and Slugworth and all the other rotten chocolate makers. But now, listen to me. I want no messing about and when you go in, and no touching, no meddling, and no tasting. Is that agreed? Yes, yes, cried the children. We won't touch a thing. We won't, we won't, promise. Up to now, nobody else, not even a Noompa Loompa, has ever been allowed in here. He opened the door and stepped out of the boat and into the room. The four children and their parents all scrambled after him. <clears throat> don't touch, and don't knock anything over. It's Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, Christine. What else do you think it is? Charlie Bucket stared around the gigantic room in which he now found himself. The place was like a witch's kitchen. All about him, black metal pots were boiling and bubbling on huge stoves and kettles. If anyone knows anything about chocolate, they wouldn't be big black metal pots. They would be copper. Jeez Louise. 
Would someone please go and talk to Rold, or at least his publishers, about this? This is just silly. Let's see. Kettles were hissing and pans were sizzling, and strange iron machines were clanking and sputtering, and there were pipes running all over the ceilings and the walls, and the whole place was filled with smoke and steam and delicious, rich smells. Mr. Wonka himself had suddenly become even more excited than usual, and anyone could see that this was the room that he loved the best of all. <laughs> he was hopping about among the saucepans and the machines like a child among Christmas presents, not knowing which one to look at first. He lifted the lid from a huge pot and took a sniff, and then he rushed over and dipped a finger into a barrel of sticky yellow stuff and had a taste, and then he skipped across to one of the machines and turned half a dozen knobs this way and that, and then he peered anxiously through the glass door of a gigantic oven, rubbing his hands and crackling with, cackling with delight. <laughs> <sighs> with the delight of what he saw inside, then he ran over to another machine, a small, shiny affair that kept on going, and every time it went, a large green marble dropped out of it onto a, into a basket onto the floor. At least, it looked like a marble. Everlasting gobstoppers! They're completely new. I'm inventing them for children who are given very little pocket money. You can put them and you can put an everlasting gobstopper in your mouth and you can suck on it and suck on it and suck on it and suck it and it will never, ever get any smaller. It's like gum, said Violet Beauregard. It is not like gum. Gum is for chewing and if you tried chewing one of these gobstoppers, you'd break your teeth off. And they never get any smaller and they never disappear. Never. At least, I don't think they do. There's one of them being tested in the this very moment in the testing room next door. And Oompa Loompa is sucking on it. He's been sucking on it for nearly a year now and without stopping. And it's just as good as ever. Now, over here. <laughs> Over here, I'm inventing a completely new line of toffees. He stopped beside a large saucepan. The saucepan was full of thick, gooey, purplish treacle, boiling and bubbling. Now, if you don't know what treacle is, by standing on his toes, little Charlie could just see inside of the pot. Treacle. Treacle. Um... Treacle is kind of what you would, if you could slam together molasses and um, molasses and like hard rock candy kind of thing. It's, it's, it's most intense like that. So um, it is the byproducts of uh, sugar processing. And so all those minerals and those extra yummy things. Um, those uh the, all that stuff is left so it's kind of one of those um it, yes tr look it up it's kind of an interesting thing i'm actually interested in probably making it i'm going to be making some golden syrup here very soon and i will probably also make some treacle so let's see now let's see that's a new line of toffees he stopped beside a large saucepan and in the saucepan was th full of thick gooey purplish treacle <laughs> that's hair toffee you eat just one little tiny bit of it, and in exactly half an hour, a brand new, luscious, thick, silky, beautiful crop of hair will start growing out all over the top of your head, and a moustache, and a beard. A beard? cried Veruca Salt. Who wants a beard, for heaven's sake? <clears throat> it would suit you very well, Miss Salt, said Wonka. But unfortunately, the mixture is not quite right yet. I've got it too strong. It works too well. I tried it on an Oompa Loompa yesterday in the testing room, and immediately a huge black beard started shooting out of his chin, and the beard grew so fast that it was trailing all over the floor as a thick, hairy carpet. It was growing faster than we could cut it, and in the end we had to use a lawnmower to keep it in check. But I'll get the mixture right soon, and <clears throat> when I do, there'll be no excuse for, uh, anymore for little boys and girls to go about with bald heads. <laughs> But, Mr. Wonka, said Mike TV, little boys and girls never go with that, with, don't argue with me, child, please, I'll, don't argue. 
It's such a waste of precious time. Now, over here, if you will all step this way, I will show you something that I'm terrifically proud of. Oh, do be careful. Don't knock anything over. Stand back. 